brought to you by CGTN Europe. Hello and welcome to this week's Razor podcast. I'm Shanice O'Mara. And I'm Emma Keeling, coming up in this edition of Razor from CGTN Europe. I took a journey into the realm of quantum physics. You can be here and you can be at home having breakfast. That is perfectly permissible in quantum physics. Mm -mm. Guy Henderson went to see the 100-year-old tech that could help trucks go electric. You see how the automotive industry invests a lot of money into getting cars clean, but the truck needs much bigger batteries. They want to drive 10 hours straight. And I found out how a viral treatment used in Russia from the early 1900s could be used to treat brain cancers. We have generated particles with ability to cross the blood-brain barrier to find cancer stem cells to destroy them. Emma, I know this is a science podcast, but I'm going to start by testing you on your Shakespeare. Go for it. I'm actually a frustrated actor in a journalist's body. Is that true? Mm, it is totally true. <laughs> Remember the famous line from Hamlet, to be or not to be? That is the question. Well, what if I told you that if you could be and also not be at the same time, would you believe me? I would say you've ruined one of my favourite dramatic quotes, but I am sure you have a very scientific reason for that, Shinny, knowing you. Well, that's actually one of the conundrums of quantum mechanics. And although Albert Einstein wasn't a big fan of quantum physics, several decades of experiments have proved that it's actually a thing. Winfred Hensinger is a professor of quantum technologies at Sussex University. He's at the forefront of developing quantum computers, and he did his best to try and explain what quantum mechanics is. So it all started with a theoretical physicist named Jared Milburn, who had this theory that he could make an atom move forward and backward simultaneously. So that is a possibility in quantum physics. So the idea of something being in two places at the same time is so strange. Quantum physics is unbelievably strange. And you can be here and you can be at home having breakfast. That is perfectly permissible in quantum physics. We don't just see this with big objects, but we can see it with individual atoms. Then there is this phenomenon called entanglement, meaning something what happens here in a way can influence something happening on the other end of the universe instantaneously. And that is entanglement. It's a very strange correlation. There are really things which you can't really relate to our context, to our daily life, yet they do exist and and they're actually responsible for all the phenomena we see around us. These are the the very ingredients of, of nature itself. Okay, Um, it's not only counterintuitive, it's very, very confusing. I don't think my brain is not big enough for this story. So we're talking about pushing around individual atoms. I I visualize this happening on teeny tiny machines. And you know what? You would think that because it's happening on such an atomic scale that everything would be tiny. But actually, it's the biggest computer I've ever seen in my life. (laughs) Inside this vacuum system, just behind that window sits a microchip. This microchip emits electric fields and these electric fields hold individual charged atoms or ions. So really allowing that control of the ion. Absolutely. What you see here is a laser. Now this laser is used to cool atoms all the way close to minus 273 degrees Celsius using just light, just using a laser beam. It's counterintuitive because usually lasers are used to burn things. That's right. And we point that laser beam onto a moving ion. And now as the ion approaches this laser beam, it absorbs light and that slows the atom down. And this slowing down process corresponds to cooling the atom to really low temperature. So if something is fast, it's hot something is very cold stationary and we use light to slow the ions down until they're entirely still and once they're entirely still we use them to execute computations. You can really hear in Winfred's voice that he's so passionate about how to move just two ions around and I know it's not going to get you very far in computing but it's just the start and what Winfred and his team are now working on is a way of manipulating millions of more ions all at the same time. Imagine you'd have a billion ions, a billion ions. Imagine if you needed 
laser beams to execute logical operations. It's a lot of lasers. And you need a lot of lasers. You need hundreds of thousands of millions of lasers like this. And so what we've invented here at Sussex, a new way how to execute quantum uh, computations. And instead of using lasers, we can do this by microwaves. The same technology as what is in your mobile phone. We apply voltages to a microchip and these voltages in the presence of these global microwave fields can now execute computations. All right, so uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Shani, because I'm getting very lost on this story. So once they've miniaturized quantum computers, once they've got these down to you know, desktop, can, will I have a desktop? Can I have a desktop quantum computer? Sadly not. I mean, I would love to have a quantum computer working out my taxes exactly. because it takes me so long and it's so complicated. But these kinds of computers are going to be huge to begin with. I mean, they take up whole rooms. All right. So but what are these quantum computers for? Well, the main purpose of them is to work things out that have many factors involved. So it means that you can apply quantum computing to things like working out how the brain functions or working out how leaves on a tree will be growing at certain rates. And so things that have lots of things going on at the same time can be worked out using quantum. Now, we think of electric vehicles as pretty modern and high tech. But many parts of the world have been running electric trains for over 100 years. Countries are trying to decarbonise the transport system and some very clever people, and we have a lot of these on this show, have been testing whether the electric train system could work on the roads, providing power to trucks. Guy Henderson went to Berlin and Siemens Mobility Department and spoke to the CEO, Michael Peters, who explained the problem. You see how the automotive industry invested a lot of money into getting cars clean, but a truck needs much bigger batteries. If yeah. you think about, yeah. they want to drive 10 hours straight, huge distances, and, and if you had to just recharge one hour every 10 hours, you would have to take 10% of the trucks and put them on a parking lot just to charge them. I mean, this would be a huge logistical effort. Um, the trucks in Germany deliver 70% of the freights, so it's a key component to try to get that clean, and obviously um, one of the ideas we have is to use a technology that's... Uh, Quite, uh, quite old um, from the railway industry is yeah. catenary with, uh, with a pantograph. So what Michael describes there is what's called the pantograph. And it's the system of wires that runs above an electric train line and it delivers power into the engine. Battery technology has always been keeping engineers and scientists baffled for a long, long time. But Siemens Mobility are testing a system like this on the roads with electric or hybrid trucks so that they can continually charge their batteries as they drive along a highway. Now, this sounds great in theory, but as Bastian Blasser explains, a road version has a few more challenges to deal with. Think of how a train would drive. It has a track. It's not really moving left or right of its truck on the other side. It's driven right now by humans. Think of there's a traffic jam just ahead or there's fog or any reason for really immediately turning left or right. So this pantograph needs to deal with this situation as well. But you hit a pothole, it's going to move faster than that. It's going to, go, it's going to be a jolt, isn't it? So does, it, does the pantograph, realistically, it's going to lose contact for a moment when that happens? And does that matter, you know, if it does lose contact? Not really. It yeah. does not, even if there's a short interruption, wouldn't really disrupt power connection to the truck. Even if this might happen, it's only a short moment of kilometers driving along those catenary lines. Now, if you want to see Guy Henderson in a truck with one of these systems in action, uh, oh, actually, you know what? They didn't trust him to drive a shinny. They would have trusted us. But Guy, if you want to see Guy <laughs> Henderson standing in a truck watching somebody else drive it, uh, you should go to our website, cgtn.com slash Europe, and you can find the Razor pages. Hasso Gunyas from the Siemens Mobility told Guy how close the system was to becoming a reality. Well, the, the real good point about this is that this is based on very mature technology, railway electrification that has been around for more than 100 years. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of experience with this technology, yeah. and that helps us, of course, also to roll this out on a bigger scale. How extensive, you know, what does the future look like for these? Is this going to be connecting Europe to Asia, or are we talking about just small veins off the major arteries? One study was, for example, performed by the BDI, which is the German Association of Industries. Mm -hmm. They found out that this system is actually the most economic investment you can have in terms of decarbonizing road freight transport. And they did this on the basis of Germany only. 
But they also said that as soon as this expands beyond the borders of Germany, then this will become even more economical. Now, it was used as part of the standard care in Russia in the early 1900s. The West also used it extensively in the 1920s and 30s. Now this treatment may be used to treat brain cancer. They are called bacteriophages, or phages for short. It sounds like a wonder solution for brain cancer, but why haven't we heard more about them up until now? Well, it is an old therapy, um, and Western countries actually stopped using it because antibiotics came along. But now they are being looked at as a way to treat cancer, which doesn't always respond to typical treatments such as chemotherapy drugs. I spoke to a man, Richard Preston, who was diagnosed with an aggressive brain cancer called glioblastoma. They told me that it's either going to be good news or bad news. Wait a couple of weeks and we'll tell you what's going on. After the two weeks, they said, it's bad news. You've got terminal brain cancer. It's malignant, so, and it could grow back at any time. I mean, I, I had this thing behind my left eye, bigger than my left eye, um, within five days of the optician saying, there's something dodgy in the back of your left eye. I was in the operation room, having a six-hour operation on my head. Did, the, did they tell you that you've got a certain amount of time to live? I was, I was diagnosed at the end of November t 2013. So they said, you've got two years. Um, but I'm now doing very well. And after, uh, so I've celebrated five years this year. He's a really lovely man and he loves a good chat, does Richard. But I think what was so overwhelming with him was, you know, when you hear that story from him about, you know, being diagnosed so suddenly, when you see the size of the, you know, the, the, the scar on his head, it's just, yeah, it's quite overwhelming. So, uh, yeah, he's an incredible man. He must be so strong to have pulled through despite, you know, being told that he's got terminal cancer. I mean, what an incredible character. I mean, people always sort of ask the question, how long have I got? So, yeah, he is one of the lucky ones um, because success rates for treating brain can tumours like this are so low. Uh, Dr Matthew Williams, he's a consultant oncologist at Imperial College in London, and he explained why brain cancers are difficult to treat. Brain tumours are really niche, so they're very rare. A lot of research is built around getting tumour tissue, but getting tumour tissue is much easier if you've got a lump on your arm or a lump on your breast than if you've got something inside your skull. Why is it that brain cancer is so hard to treat? There are two obvious things. The first thing is that they're rare and therefore we don't get that many examples of them. But the second thing is the brain is insulated from the rest of the world by something we call the blood-brain barrier. And so actually most of the chemotherapy drugs that we give that might work for breast or lung or colorectal cancer just don't get into the brain. So you can give them, you can give them as a drip, they get around the body, and if you actually measure how much drug gets into the brain, you get hardly any in the brain. This blood-brain barrier sounds like a really unique, but also real challenge compared to the rest of the body. I'm guessing then that this is where phages comes in. Yeah, so basically the brain doesn't see phages as a threat. Um, so they don't get stopped by the blood-brain barrier, which is why other cancer treatments fail to work. So once they're in the brain, how do they work? So do you remember that sci-fi film, Aliens? So the aliens grew from inside the host person and they multiplied and they burst out. Yeah, sadly, I do remember that. <laughs> and I was haunted for months after that movie. But anyway, it's a bit like that, but in a good way. So the bacteriophage is a virus that attacks bacteria and they attach themselves and then they inject their own DNA and phages multiply inside the bacteria and eventually they overwhelm it and, and they kill the bacteria. That sounds absolutely terrifying, but so good, because it sounds like a really effective treatment. Yeah, and, and so what they've done, and this is the really clever bit, is they've then adapted it to do the same thing, but with cancer cells. So they've been modified to, a, to find these cancer cells, attach themselves, they squirt their DNA, which has also been modified, into the cancer cell, and then kill it. So I met Professor Armin Hajitu. He is so passionate about phage therapy, and he's been working for 12 years on this cancer treatment using bacteriophages. In these cells, you find what we call cancer stem cells, which are resistant to chemo and radiation therapy, and from the tumors, from which the tumors grow back. This is where our phage comes with this advantage because we showed that our phage can find these cancer stem cells and destroy them. So are you excited? Do you think this is going to work when you do human trials? We are excited because we have generated phage particles with ability to overcome 
the resistance of glioblastoma in addition to their ability to cross the blood-brain barrier to find cancer stem cells to destroy them. Emma, this research sounds so amazing and so pioneering, but how close are we to actually being able to use it for real? Yeah, well, that's always the, the challenge, isn't it? But animal testing has been positive, and although the clinical trials in humans are a few years away, Professor Hijitu, he is all, he's very cautious. He doesn't want to get everybody's hopes up, but he did use the word hope. He did say that they are hopeful. Um, and so I guess we just, you know, he, that gave me a little bit of hope as well. So fingers crossed. And it's just one additional way of fighting cancer, which can't be a bad thing. Mm -mm. That's it for this week. If you want to watch the films from this episode, go to cgtn.com slash Europe and click on Razor. Until next time. Thank you.